Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Grant Hunter. I'm the MLA for Tabor Warner, and I'll be your MC here today. I want to first of all thank you for joining us here. I want to thank a few members. I, I see that uh, Drew Barnes is here. Uh, I see also that um, Roger Reed is here as well. Uh, we have also uh, we have uh, Nathan Newdorf from, from Lethbridge, and we have a couple other special guests that I'll be introducing here. We're excited to be joined here by the Premier, uh, who is also the newly elected MLA for Brooks Medicine Hat, Danielle Smith. And we'd, al we'd also like to thank Minister Dreeshen, the Minister of Transportation, for, for being here. Actually, I also do want to thank all of our um, municipal partners that have been so helpful in being able to help work out lots of the details. I see lots of you here today as well. And, and no announcement would be complete without uh, thanking Bill Chapman, a good friend of mine, uh, who's president of the Highway 320 Association for the hard work that he's done and the monumental work that he's done to be able to help get us to this point. So with that, thank you. With that, I want to uh, have you help me welcome the Premier of Alberta, Danielle Smith, to the podium to make a very important announcement. Well, thanks, Grant, and thanks to Leanne and Daryl and their kids, Alyssa and Evan, for hosting us here today. I'm so pleased to be here and to be joined by not only other MLAs who are impacted by the, this twinning decision, but also Drew Barnes, who I know has been of an outspoken advocate on making sure that, that we prioritize the, this, this really important transportation project. So we've got uh, Minister Devin Dreeshen, our transportation minister, who'll be making a few comments, as well as uh, you've, been, you've met uh, Tabor Warner's MLA, Grant Hunter, to set the stage for major upgrades to the highway network in Southern Alberta. This comes at an unprecedented time for our province. We're facing a significant economic and political headwinds driven by global economic uncertainties and an uncooperative federal partner in Ottawa. There's no telling how long these challenges are going to last. But I can tell you that the surest way for, uh, to insulate Alberta from any shocks is to keep on investing in infrastructure and to find new ways to support growth and development. Our government understands that and we're focused on creating jobs and diversifying our economy. I've asked Minister Dreeshen and his team to accelerate priority investments in transportation projects, and I've asked them to expand economic corridors that link our province with major trading partners. That's especially important here in southern Alberta, which is home to so much of our agri-food and manufacturing sectors. Getting products to market to customers quickly and cost-effectively matters more than ever. It's key to attracting fresh growth and investment. And in an era of global supply chain disruptions, it's key to building a reputation as a trusted supplier across Canada and the world. In fact, it was Highway 3 that was first opened and provided the only route out of BC during the floods last year. And that is why I've asked Minister Dreeshen to start working on plans to twin all of the remaining portions of Highway 3. <laughs> Today we are moving forward with the first part of that plan. That's why I'm happy to announce that the government is moving forward with plans to twin a 46 kilometer stretch of Highway 3 between Tabor and Burdett. We've issued a request for proposal to three bidders and we aim to have a contract in place so construction can start early next year. I know that progress is a big deal for residents and businesses and we hope to see more very shortly. Highway 3 is a main connector linking Alberta with neighboring provinces to the east and west. So there are plenty of big commercial trucks mixed in with local traffic. Twinning this section of highway will make travel between Tabor and Burdett safer for families and in fact all vehicles. Increased traffic capacity will also ensure businesses can get raw materials and move products to market more efficiently than ever. I'm excited about the promise this, proje this project holds for the region. I know that, uh, that I just met with Grant Hunter yesterday and he talked about this being really the agri-food industrial corridor for the entire province with 70% of the irrigation that takes place down here and a number of big agri-food processing plants. We've got to continue to support that development. In closing, I want to thank the Highway 3 Twinning Development Association for keeping the pressure on the province to sign off on this vital upgrade. You are a fantastic example of the community-led campaign campaigns that unite people and organizations to make life better for everyone. Your persistence has paid off. I know it's taken a long time to get this far, but you now have a government that listens and responds to your concerns. 
we will build a stronger, safer, more economically resilient Southern Alberta together. I hope to see you again when we celebrate the open, opening of the newly twinned highway. Thank you all for, the, uh, for being out here today and we'll look forward to taking questions. Let me hand it off now back to Grant Hunter. Well, thank you, Premier, for that tremendous news that has been long waited. I know that as I again look at uh, my friend Bill Chapman, he has been spending, I think, a couple of decades on this announcement. So this is exciting news, one that uh, it will be well received for the people of Southern Alberta. So it's also a pleasure to have Transportation and Economic Corridors Minister Devin Dreeshen with us today. Devin has been a good friend for many years to me and has proven to be a get her done type of person. And so with that, I asked uh, Minister Dreeshen to, to be able to come up and give us a little more details about this, pro this uh, uh, plan. Well, well, thank you very much, Grant. Uh, it's, it's great to be here and to see some federal partners here, MP Glenn Motts and LeVar Payne, uh, just really great federal partners that we've had over the past and, and currently uh, in Ottawa, because obviously as, as Alberta, we and as the Economic Corridor Minister, we, we, we are in the business of making friends. We, we have to go and at least make alliances with at least two other levels of government to get our products to, to Tidewater. So, um, so when it's, whether it's provincial friends, municipal friends, uh, we, we are in the business of making friends and, uh, and trying to get our, our world-class products to market. So it's great to, great to see you guys here. And uh, the Honourable Grant Hunter, he, uh, He's been promoting Southern Alberta since uh, the first time I met him about four years ago, especially when it came to, to irrigation. And uh, we just saw just a couple years ago, just tremendous investment in irrigation in Southern Alberta, where over 200,000 new acres of irrigated land is, is gonna hit in this region. And that's just fantastic. And again, it shows the importance of Highway 3 because of all that investment coming into this region, our, our highways are being stressed and that is a good thing. So that is why the government of Alberta needs to be able to step up and to match that uh, economic activity and make sure that not just the economy can grow and flourish in the future, but also residents in the area can, can get to and from where they're going and back home safely. So it's, it's so important on the humanitarian side, on the personal side, but also to, to grow our economy, especially in the, the agriculture and the oil and gas sector here, here in Southern Alberta. And, and I know that the Premier mentioned the, the BC floods. Having uh, Highway 3 as a route for British Columbians, uh, really the only route back to the mainland of, of BC was, was Highway 3. So just being able to reroute it, traffic uh, during times of need is, is another really important reason why we're twinning Highway 3. And, uh, and as was mentioned, uh, we are going to do this in phases. So obviously the first phase we'll see shovels in the ground this spring between Tabor and Burdette, that's a 46 kilometer stretch. And there's seven other phases to come. And there's, there's lots of functional planning studies to go. There's a lot of land that needs to be bought. And we have to make sure that everybody in the area, whether it's, it's Bow Island or the Bakani Nation, that, uh, that they're involved in the planning process so we get the best route um, possible when we finally make it all the way from Medicine Hat to, to BC with a twinned Highway 3. So there's a lot of work to be done. There's, there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, the work starts now, and uh, I'm excited to see the shovels on the ground this spring on this very important project. So thank you guys so much for coming here today. Thank you, Minister Dreeshen. It's, uh, once again, I want to thank uh, the ministers for being here, for the Premier for being here for this exciting announcement. One person that I failed to, to mention, I want to be able to say thank you very much to Michaela Fry, who used to be the uh, MLA for uh, Brooks Medicine Hat. She did a lot of work on this, and so I want to make sure that she gets recognized here today as well. So thank you very much. So that concludes the formal portion of our program today, and uh, we'll now be willing to take questions. So we'll ask uh, questions be addressed to Highway 3 first, please. We'll take, three que or we'll take questions from in person. You have, um, as always, a supplemental, and then we'll go to the phone lines. Uh, Alex McQuaig, Western Producer. Um, in 2020, July 2020, uh, a 40 plus kilometer stretch was announced for between Tabor and Burdette. Is this the same 
stretch of road that was announced back in 2020? Yeah, so, so that announcement was, was for the feasibility study, the planning study. So right now, this announcement for the RFP that's going out will actually have three bidders bidding on that stretch of road. And the winner will be announced soon by, by us. And as soon as we, we get the new road construction builder, they're gonna be building uh, that stretch of highway this spring. So you'll see construction on that Tabor to Burdette highway uh, starting this spring. And can you- And that'll, sorry, that'll be the first of eight phases to complete all of Highway 3. Yeah, seven other phases, correct? Correct, yep. So can you stick a dollar amount to this or any details about what the next phase will be or might be? I'd like to, but for out of respect to taxpayers, we're not going to because it is an open competitive bid process. There's three bidders that are bidding on this or will be bidding on this starting today. So I don't want to give a, a dollar amount for that because it might obviously affect the, the bidding process. Sorry, out, outside the Tabor Burdett stretch, I mean, what's the next, what would the next stretch be of, of the seven other remaining phases? Yeah, so the, the seven others, I, I can go through them all. They, they are the, the news release. Okay. But essentially, it, it all adds up to 215 kilometers of, because there is about a 100 kilometer stretch already twinned by Lethbridge on Highway 3, but the remaining 215 kilometers, the other seven phases or eight in total, they, they will be staged out probably about a, a 10 year phase. And I, I'm pushing my luck here, but just one yeah. last question regarding the Crow's Nest Pass section that's uh, been particularly identified as particularly difficult because of the mountain range and, and some of the space limitations. Is, uh, is that still a challenge, I guess? Yeah, the, the, that will be. Obviously the train farther east you go is a, a lot easier to, to twin Highway 3. But, uh, but yeah, we have great engineers in, in transportation economic corridors to do that feasibility study and make sure that we're going in a, a very safe area when, when we twin Highway 3 in that area. Please. Uh, Gates Gordon with Chat News. Uh, so Minister Drishin, I uh, just uh, wanted to ask, obviously this has been uh, a, an ongoing issue for decades. Why was uh, now the time to prioritize this for the government? Well, I, I look at the lady over my right shoulder. When, uh, when she made me the, the economic corridor minister as well, um, she wanted to make sure that we looked at economic regions within Alberta as well as outside of our borders and how we could try to help them grow and expand and really focus on, on the economy because when we have strong economy and strong entrepreneurs and strong business leaders being able to, to do what they do best, which is create jobs, then we're obviously supporting families in those areas and then we're also building up strong communities. So this really goes part and parcel of how we can build our province. So it, this Highway 3 corridor is, uh, is a very important stretch, as I mentioned earlier, in agriculture and also in oil and gas. So expanding it was, was really the, the top mandate that I got from the Premier, and that's, that's why we're here today. Do you have one follow-up? Yeah, uh, for, uh, for the Premier, if uh, that's okay. Um, for yourself, you know, why was it so important to have this, uh, this um, kind of addressed at, during your campaign uh, and then it really being your first um, you know, promise that you're, you're, um, you're making here? Well, the number one issue I heard during the campaign was Highway 3, and it, it not only impacts my riding, but impacts the uh, riding of Cypress Medicine Hat through Burns, as it impacts Grant Hunters, and it also impacts Lethbridge as well, uh, which is why we've got Nathan Newdorf here today. So to me, if we can, if we can uh, create um, the, uh, the transportation infrastructure to help this entire region grow, then that's, that's the job that we've got to do. I know that with the recovery in the economy, it, it, it feels like it has not um, hit this region uh, quite yet. And I think we have to do what we can to send a signal to the business investment community that we're going to do the investments that are necessary for them to be able to relocate down here. I think that there's some in incredible in, uh, investment that's already happened in the agri-food processing. And I think by, by sending the signal that we're going to build this out and create easier routes, not only to go east-west, but certainly also make it easier to go north-south, I think that is just going to attract even more investment here. So that would be part of it. But there's other corridors as well that the minister is looking at. Certainly we've got a similar problem up in the Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray. Murray area where Grand Prairie and Fort McMurray aren't connected. There'll be other issues that we've got to deal with building this corridor coming down the east side of the province as well and a few others going outside the province. So I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, Minister Devin Drishan has um, taken so seriously the addition to his portfolio responsibilities of economic corridors and this will be the first of several that we'll be able to announce. Thank you. Thank you. Samantha Johnson, Medicine Hat News. So for the um, Medicine Hat to seven persons um, for twinning. Are we? St are you still looking at doing a um, a bypass with an interchange? And and I heard there was also going to be a bridge 
another bridge across? Yeah, so that, that 15 kilometer stretch, uh, we are gonna do the planning studies have been completed and engineering will be done at spring of 2023. So we'll, we'll sp next spring we'll be able to answer that question better right. on, on what exactly design will, will be there. Right, but that's still on the table is, is the bypass um, option. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. All right, operator, can we go online? Thank you, Chris Varco, Calgary Herald. Hi, this is a question for the Premier. Premier, why did your government decide in the midterm uh, fiscal update to pull back the commitment that was made in August to allocate $1.7 billion into the Heritage Fund? Do you want to see if there's any questions on this issue first? Yeah, can we uh, stick to questions on Highway 3 first, please? No, we'll get back to him. On yeah, we'll get back to you on that. Any other questions if, on the phone? If there are. Do we have any questions on the phone regarding Highway 3? Next question, Michelle Belfontaine, CBC. Oh, hi there. This is a question for Premier. Um, Premier, I want to ask you about the mask mandate. Um, yeah, that's... The, the regulations that you put... Just, just ask for yeah. if there's any other yeah. questions online first about All right. three. No, this is not how it works. No, guys, there's no... I mean, we're on the phone here, and the Premier's making herself available, so... Just say we're doing it after. Yeah, we we're doing that after. It's very hard to restrict... Yes, we're doing Are that you after. Are through again? Are you going to put me through again? Just give one more time for just one yeah. more time for Highway Three. Yeah, one more time for Highway Three, please. And then we can get. And then we'll get back to you. Then I'll go back to yeah. Barco's question. All right. Okay. Let me do Chris Barco. All right. Uh, so answering the question on the uh, the budget, I think the the finance minister answered that yesterday, that we have a, a complete planning process that we have to do around the the surplus, and there's 5.8 billion dollars, I believe, that we've got to have a surplus plan uh, management strategy around. During the leadership race, all the leadership candidates had different ideas about how we ought to manage that surplus. Um, whether how much do you put towards debt repayment, how much do you put towards savings, and how much do you put towards infrastructure? And so we still have some discussion that we need to do around that. And so we wanted, I think the finance minister wanted to be respectful of the fact that there were different opinions during the leadership race, and also respectful of the fact that we need to have a full caucus discussion around it. To me, uh, that's just the difference in leadership style, is that I, I do believe that these kinds of decisions should be made through the proper processes as opposed to just the finance minister deciding or just the premier deciding. So there is going to be a robust surplus management strategy that comes for, forward in budget 2022, and I, or 2023, and so I think you'll be able to get the answer to that question there. And then Michelle? Operator, do you want to put CBC through? Yeah, should we do in person? Yeah, we'll do in person while we're waiting for Michelle. Michelle, your line is open. Just, just wait. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you for taking my question, Premier. Um, I wanted to ask you about yesterday's uh, new regulations. Uh, prohibiting mask mandates and complete shifts to online learning in schools. On the issue of Alberta Health Services, you've said that you want to have more local decision making. So I'm wondering why you aren't using the same principle with school masking and, uh, and imposing a one-size-fits-all approach across the province. So I'm asking you, why not allow school trustees to decide what's best for their students? Well, if you look at what happened with the Alberta School Boards Association, they passed a motion saying that they would give deference to the Chief Medical Officer of Health. And I think they recognize, because they don't have doctors on staff at school boards, that they have to rely on medical opinion. And so I was pleased to see that motion, and I was pleased when I asked them to try to create a normal learning environment for our kids, that they were very receptive to that message. I think that we have to make sure that we're supporting choice, so that no one's discriminated against, that um, anyone is welcome to wear a mask if they feel that that is the, the right choice for them. But we should not be forcing uh, parents to, to mask their kids, and we shouldn't be denying education to kids who, uh, who, do, who turn up without a mask. So I think that, the, that this decision has also been validated across the country. There's no mask mandates in British Columbia, in Saskatchewan, in Quebec. I noticed with some interest that there was a great debate 
at an Ottawa school board that uh, ended up having this very motion defeated on a tie vote was very fractious over the course of two days. So I think that our school boards welcome the fact that we've given some clear direction on this. We've got to make sure that the schools stay open for in-person learning and that there is also choice for, for parents and for students. And that's why we made the decision we did is to give that clear direction. As a follow-up, though, I mean, medical evidence has said that masking works best when everybody masks, right? Because when you're wearing a mask, you're protecting other people. You're not necessarily protecting yourself. And given the number of children who are, are quite ill uh, and the number of absences that we're seeing in Alberta, if you want to keep kids learning in classrooms, wouldn't it be better to have everybody mask so there isn't a, a, a need for online learning? Uh, I guess here's the question that I have. I mean, we, we, we took some pretty extreme and draconian measures when we had a novel virus that we didn't know how it was going to impact people. They, there were some pretty extreme projections about the number of people who would die as a result of getting COVID. Where we made the decision in June to move to an endemic phase in the treatment of this virus. RSV is a very common childhood virus. Influenza, we know that we've been treating it endemic for years and we're, we're just not going to normalize these kind of extreme measures every single respiratory virus season. What we need a normal school environment for our children and we need to make sure that the, that the classrooms stay open so to be able to support our parents. So I, I think that we, we, when we said that we were moving to endemic, we were, we were serious about it. And so I'm, I'm grateful that the, uh, the school boards are, uh, seem to be supportive of that. And we'll continue to do what we can to address this, uh, this very difficult time. Every single time we get into fall respiratory virus season, there is pressure on the healthcare system. And that's why we're doing healthcare reform, is to make sure that we can manage that additional pressure. All right, we have Dean on the line, and then we'll do two in-person questions and wrap up. Oh. Dean Bennett. Thanks. Uh, Premier, off topic, uh, you've, uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering if I can get some clarity from you on where you stand on public health care. So you said in your June 2021 position paper that health care is fundamentally broken and needs some sort of either co-pays, deductibles, uh, health spending accounts, something to actually make it work. Do you still stand by your June 2021 position paper? I'm 100% in favour of following the principles of the Canada Health Act. And one of the principles of the Canada Health Act is comprehensiveness. We don't have a comprehensive system. And so health spending accounts are meant to provide coverage for all the things not currently covered by healthcare and to give families who are currently paying 100% out of pocket for those services uh, some assistance in being able to pay for them. So um, there, there will be nothing in my reforms that contravene the Canada Health Act. Everything will be done under the umbrella of the, uh, of the publicly funded system where it's required. And then for those things that are not covered, we're going to do what we can to make sure that we broaden the system out. That's what the health spending accounts are for. Thanks. So we, should you proceed with the health spending accounts and you win the next election, will we be seeing co-pays and deductibles? Well, well right. A return to health premiums? No. Right now, um, people pay 100% of the cost of physiotherapy and chiropractic and dentistry and uh, the pharmaceutical costs, if you don't have a, a, a pharmaceutical coverage and massage therapy, there's probably a list of 100 different things people pay 100% of the cost for. We're gonna help defray some of that cost. And the, uh, the, if the, the remainder, I guess, would be out of pocket, <laughs> but it already is out of pocket. And so we're doing what we can to make sure that some of those needed coverages uh, that families have an, an easier pay, way to pay for them. What you probably will see is that we want to change our tax code so that people can make personal contributions to their health spending accounts so that they can start saving up for kids' braces or laser eye surgery or other things that aren't covered. We'll hopefully have employers also want to contribute to those health spending accounts so that they become a tool to manage the preventative side of the health care system. But everything we do is going to be under the auspices of the Canada Health Act. All right, back to in person. Uh, yeah, a question for the Premier, Alex McQuaig, Western Producer. Uh, can I just get a, a general uh, comment regarding how you see the Public Order Emergency Commission in general, and specifically uh, Alberta's requests for military assistance in, in, in uh, trying to deal with that situation? At Coots. Well, you know, I'm watching, you're, wa you're talking about the, the federal, uh, the, 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 uh, the federal commission that's going, of inquiry going on right now? Well, I'm, I'm very disappointed in what we're seeing with the political decisions that were made. There was no justification 
for, uh, for launching into the Emergencies Act and creating the incredible amount of disruption and violation of rights that occurred. And I think that's becoming very clear in the, as, we, as we watch the testimony, that every time I see a minister speak, it becomes less and less justifiable what they did. And so I'm pleased that we have in the legislation a requirement to do these kind of public inquiries so that we can find out just how poorly the decisions were that were made. Uh, but there was there was no reason for for them to to do this, and and I think that they're going to suffer the political consequences of that. <laughs> Sorry, just that, just on the second part of that question, the Alberta's request for military assistance. Uh, do you see that? Uh, I mean, how do you view that? Uh, as as you know, um, I took a position in favor of freedom, and I took a position. In, in favor of reducing the or eliminating the restrictions. And so we had a, a leadership race where my position was validated, uh, that people uh, clearly uh, wanted to make sure that we did a, a better balance between protecting the public, but also protecting personal freedom. And so it'll, you can maybe ask the, the, former, uh, the former premier why he made some of the decisions that he did. They would not have been my decisions. I wouldn't have gone down that track. All right, last question. Sure. Do we have any? <laughs> Yeah, Carson with CTV News. Uh, we saw yet another young person with influenza die this week. Are you at all concerned that provincial regulatory changes announced yesterday could put the health of even more Alberta students at risk? Influenza is really dangerous, not only to the very old, to the, but also to the very young. And we've known that for a very long time. And so I'm, I'm pleased that so many parents are being responsible and when their kids are sick, they're keeping them at home. Uh, we know that we uh, have to do uh, some more work to make sure that we can get children's Tylenol in the hands of parents because that is going to be one of the ways in which we can make sure we bring fever down and we're going to, to keep on working to get, to get supply here. But I have to be mindful when we make a decision that we also have to be talking about the, the students who are suffering severe mental health crisis and who are suffering learning loss. When I was at the Alberta School Board's meeting, I spoke with one rural trustee who told me that there had been two suicides in their school since the beginning of the year. And so I think the real problem that we have when we look at health conditions is we have to look across the full range of health impacts and the impacts, masking the impacts of disruption, the impacts of, of canceling school programs has had a devastating impact on, on children's mental health. It's why our health minister, um, our, pardon me, it's why our education minister and our mental health and addictions minister have both announced increases in mental health funding for our kids. And we're just not going to create additional problems that are going to create a potential generational health crisis if we do not return to a normal school environment. So my, my goal is to maintain a normal school environment, to tell parents, please be responsible if your kids are sick, keep them home, and uh, just to make sure that they've got the medicine that they need so that they can have some confidence if their kids are sick. And follow up. Yeah, just to follow up on that, point. you've touched on mental health, you've stressed that lots in schools. Uh, how do you weigh that against the importance of physical health? Well, they're all very important. I mean, we, we know that we have an opioid toxicity death and problem. We also have a suicide crisis. We, we, we don't do daily reporting on those. Uh, we don't do daily reporting on the number of people who have, um, have deteriorated in their condition because they're waiting with surgical backlogs. Um, but I have to be mindful of all of that. We've got to create an environment where we're dealing with the urgent health need of today, but not creating additional health needs of the future. And so that's the balance that we have to go. We know that influenza is dangerous. We've known this for, for hundreds of years. And we know, also know that when we treat it as endemic, we have to make sure there's hand washing, people stay at home when they're sick, and that we make sure that we've got the over-the-counter medication to help deal with sim symptoms. And those are the things that we're working on. All right, that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.